Hey there YouTube, welcome back to Artichoke Dip. And I'm going to do a solo playthrough so I can demonstrate how I do my solo playthroughs. And um, give you guys some information. So this is the set that I'm going to be using. Uh, this is the new D&D Essentials kit that has uh, just recently been released. And I last video I talked about it and I talked about all the things I really like about this and if you're looking to get into tabletop gaming and you're new to this um, I'll leave a description with that uh, video in the uh, comments below so you can go back to that video and watch it and you can see actually what's in the box and you know make a decision from there my personal opinion, this is an excellent set. It's a really good introduction set to D&D &D for people who are new to it and just getting into it. And alike, uh, players who may have been out of it for a while. I know a lot of um, my viewers that I talk to through comments, other people that um, I have friended on Facebook and I talk to a lot about this that have played the older versions and have recently gotten back into D&D &D and they're just kind of trying to figure out where to get started and how to get back into it and all that and I this is something I really really uh, you know suggest to give it a shot now before you ask you know I'm not getting paid by anybody to sit here and talk to you about this these are all just my personal um, interest and hobbies and so I like to make a video vlog of it and talk about it and uh, you know about soul tabletop gaming so I'm gonna cover first of all get out of the way the things that I use for my tabletop gaming and that way it'll cut down on answering questions later hey what was this what was that what was this and you'll already have that information so the first thing is is the essentials kit I already went through that I have my map right here of Fadalen, and that is um, the city that my characters are currently in. I have my 28 millimeter miniatures at that point to represent where they are at in the game world on the game board and for um, combat. Now, as I stress in all my videos and I talk about, when you play solo RPG, any type of solo RPG, you're gonna I know for me some people want theater of the mind you know the way I look at it if I can see it I can kill it and uh, so I enjoy using the miniatures and terrain to be able to put the pieces out there so I can look at it I have something that's 3d and physical that I can look at and that gives me time to actually focus on the game rather than trying to imagine all this stuff in my head and keep track of everything which would just become daunting so it really does help it's not a necessity but I do strongly suggest that so the next thing I'm going to be using besides the essentials kit let's open this up and let's get the characters out of the way will be this book right here which is called Scarlet Heroes and I have this marked. Now I don't play with this game system. Um, if you're a solo enthusiast, you know I used to use Mythic a lot. I be honest with you, I don't even really use Mythic anymore. I found this, this is what I utilize, I use and I find that the solo emulator in the back um, is just in my opinion a way more smooth um, system of using it has its own Oracle for yes no questions that also will give you some complications and twists to those answers and adds a little bit more flavor to the game and you can do away with the whole entire percentage thing and it's just way more simple to use than mythic and the way this is set up it can be used for just about any RPG out there so this is what I will be using for the emulator and as you can see there are just a lot of tables a great wealth of information it runs very smooth and 
um, you know, it'll only take you a few minutes of actually looking through this to understand everything and be able to incorporate it into your game fairly quickly. And this is all for solo gaming. This whole entire section right here is just devoted right to that. So I really like that. Um, I, like I said, this is the booklet that I use for an emulator now. Um, I've kind of shelved Mythic and it's gone into what I call my dust collector collection now at this point. So that will be the second thing I'll be using is Scarlet Heroes. Uh, you could buy the printed version or you know if you're just going to use the solo aspect of it what I would strongly suggest is check out RPG now and just see if you can get the PDF download for a lot cheaper and then you can just go to the back section of that and just print off those pages and put that with your gaming stuff. Um, me personally uh, the reason why I don't use a lot of PDFs is the problem with PDFs is you put them in your computer, they're cool at first, but then you forget about them, they get lost, and then, uh, you know, need I say any more? They just kind of get lost in a file, and you kind of forget about that. So the Scarlet Heroes will be the second thing that I'll be using for this game session. The other thing that I'm going to use is this set right here. It's called the Dungeon Tiles to Reincarnate It Set. And it comes with various tiles in it that are for a dungeon scene terrain. And of course the thing I like about it is it's measured off. So when it comes to movement and stuff like that, um, it just makes the game simpler. And um, it's very easy to set up, very easy to store. You know, when you put everything back in the box, it's about the um, width of maybe two core rule books, and you can just slide it up on the bookshelf, and it's nice and easy to store. The other thing that I'll be using for this game session is this right here, Dungeon Saga. These are doors, and with these doors, something you should know, uh, when you buy them, they do not come pre-painted you're just gonna get a set of dark brown doors and it's up to you to paint them. So, uh, which is no problem for me because I enjoy um, model building and stuff like that and painting. So, uh, you know, it's kind of cool little thing for me um, to do and pick up. So it was no big de deal for me to be able to go through and do that. All right. Now, the, before we get into this, the one thing I, really do want to stress a couple of things get out of the way first thing is when you solo RPG um, organization is key having everything organized having everything um, to where you can find it quickly and access it and you don't have a whole lot of lag time really helps it helps with the gaming experience it doesn't slow you down you're not getting bogged down with looking for items which is one of the reasons why what I will do before I even do my gaming is I will sort all my tiles by size into bins like this. So when I get to that encounter in that particular room in the map, what I can do is just go straight to here, lay the tiles down, and then just keep gaming rather than sifting through a large box of these things, trying to find them, and then, you know, 20 minutes later at that point, you've kind of forgotten what's going on, and then you have to go back through your notes or that um, whatever you're playing out of and refresh your memory as to what's going on. So there is that. Um, like I said, as I will say, organization is key. It's very important um, to keep everything organized and keep it moving nice and fluent. All right. Last thing I'm going to get out of the way before we get started is if you liked the video, please click the like button. And if you have not subscribed, click the subscribe button, click the bell icon. Every time I upload a brand new video, um, you'll be notified of it and you can keep up to date with what I got going on. Now, besides, uh, you know, tabletop RPGs, I got a few new uh, board games that I have recently put into my arsenal as well. I have not had a chance to really get into them and play them yet but as I do they are single-player games 
and um, I plan on doing some videos on those in the future. I have a lot of gaming stuff actually I want to do videos to talk about, but there's only so many hours in the day and so many days in the week to get it done. So <laughs> with that said, let's get started and let's uh, jump right into um, the system. So, oh, last but not least, what I forgot to tell you, uh, make sure you have yourself a good beverage. I prefer caffeine. And um, one thing that I find helps with tabletop RPGs a lot and kind of keeps everything together is get yourself a decent dice tray. You don't have to buy a dice tray, you can make a dice tray. Uh, I've seen people make them out of old cigar boxes, even cardboard boxes. Uh, and the whole point is you're able to roll the dice and you don't have to worry about the dice bouncing off the table and then you're chasing dice around so on and so forth and it just helps keep everything organized and keep everything um, in its place and where it should be which gets back to the whole entire organization thing. Alright, so let's jump on into this. This is 5th edition D&D &D, and we are back in the village. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown of the story background because in the rule book it does emphasize about when you create your character about writing a good story background where they come from and how I always emphasize you know why are your characters there why are they in the world and what events had led them up to this point this moment in time why are they there what has driven them to this point um, so the backstory of it is I have um, three mountain dwarves that have come out of the uh, Dwarven Kingdom of... I would have to go back here. I'm trying to remember the name I wrote down there. And I'm pulling a blank right now. I feel kind of foolish. Um, Theridan. And anyways, uh, the king, his grandson, had uh, snuck out against his wishes and decided to go out on what seemed like a innocent little uh, adventure for some excitement and well they haven't heard word from them and there's been several searches that have just turned up empty and he's received uh, rumors that he was seen here and he was seen here in different spots but um, the information is not that credible so he decided to dispatch um, three of his own to go out and track him down and bring him back so that's where my characters come in and uh, the first one that I have I'm sorry they're not all oh <laughs> wow wrong characters that was out of my first AD&D characters I want are right here I was going to say, wait a minute, half orc, what, what, what's going on here? So I have um, da um, Daemonus, and he is a rogue, and um, of course I just leveled him up. He's at second level, and he's a pretty strong, agile, uh, as far as it goes for dwarves, and I'm pretty happy with him. Uh, the next one is um, Elfati, and he is the cleric of the party. And I just leveled him up. He's got quite a few spells he can actually use. That's the thing I do like about third edition is they're pretty generous with the spells. It's not like uh, the other editions to where you really were struggling at lower levels. They're they give you more than enough spells to keep going. And then Iwas, who is the fighter. And so how the story went, and just to give you a brief breakdown before we actually get into this, Iwas is the sergeant of the uh, Royal Guard. Um, my cleric, he is not the Archdruid, but he is below the Archdruid in the Temple of Pelor. And... Uh, so he was dispatched to help these guys out. 
um, and of course the rope, who is actually the um, he answers to the king, and he's more or less like his espionage specialist. He's the guy that goes around and gathers information for him and finds out what's really going on throughout the kingdom and the lands around when he needs answers to questions that he can't get from his normal sources, but he decided to dispatch him for this because this is pretty important to him. So, you know the background of these guys right here, and let's get into what um, is going on. So, they arrived at the town, and the town's history, they're not too fond of dwarves, as a matter of fact. Um, there's some hostility still, so when they first came into town, not too many people really liked them. They kind of gave them the cold shoulder, and really the only one that was actually somewhat decent to them was the innkeeper at the Stonehill Inn, and he was the one that gave them um, the nudge in the direction of, hey, you might want to check out this location because he said, I heard some rumors that, you know, there was some uh, possibly odd happenings going on up there and, you know, strange people we normally don't see around here. So maybe he's with those people up there. And that's how they got into the uh, lighthouse with the Temple of Talos. And they have now returned. They have went to... Um, the Lion Shield Coster, which is the arms and weapons dealer, and a little persuading and talking, um, they were able to iron out a deal because with the conch that they uh, found in the lighthouse, they were able to trade that and upgrade their armor and, um, you know, make things a little bit better for them, a little bit more comfortable. So. They kind of are getting on the good side of the uh, the merchant there. So they the merchants, you know, he knows them. He's done some business. They, uh, you know, with the gold that they had turned in that they spent inside the store. So he liked that, and so the favor was starting to warm up to him. So after that, they have now at this point returned to the Stone Hill Inn. And that's where things are going to pick up and the story is going to progress from there. And that's where this is going to come in and be handy so I can show you how that all works out and how I use this. So... One of the things that I really like about this book is it gives you NPC reactions. And one of the things about solo RPG is um, a lot of people say they really struggle with NPCs. And it is a hard thing when you are solo all RPG and because you normally would have a game master explaining that to you and taking over the role of that, giving you the information you may need or withholding it. So, with Solo, you got to rely on some random tables or an emulator, and this works awesome for that. So, let's see how things are going. As they walk into the Stonehill Tavern, um, there are, I'm going to say, some faces that they have not seen before. And let's, because they are a stranger, Let's see how their reactions are once these three walk in. I've rolled a three. Annoyance. So, some of the patrons sitting there as they walk into the tavern look at them and roll their eyes and snicker like, oh god, you know, now we gotta put up with this. And are giving them a cold shoulder. But as they approach um, the bar and sit down, the innkeeper has warmed up to him and he's the friendly NPC so let's see how his reaction is to them four so he walks up and in a very polite way he tells him look I don't want to uh, right now I don't think is the best time for you guys to be hanging out in here he said uh, 
the crowd that we have in here seems to be kind of a little bit of a rabble and they're a trouble and um, with what you guys have currently going on he said uh, I really don't want you to get involved with that so it'd probably be best if you move along somewhere else and possibly come back later to where we can talk a little bit more. He said, I got some new information I want to share with you, but I don't want to share it with you with these people. So it's at that point, um, they decide to move from the Stone Hill and I think they'll move over to Barthen's Provisions and I have not been there yet and I am going to go over there and check that out and see what they have to offer. So, going into the book, I'm going to go to Barden's Provisions. The shelves of this general store stock most ordinary goods and supplies including backpacks, bed rolls, rope and rations. Barthens doesn't stock weapons or armor, but characters can purchase other adventuring gear here. With the exception of items that cost more than 25 gold. For prices, see the rule book. Characters in need of weapons or armor are directed to the Lion Shield Coster. Those looking to buy potions of healing are urged to visit um, Abadabra, Ed, <laughs> Adabra Gwyn at Umbridge Hill. And then it says, see the potions of healing sidebar on page 9. And. So that would be traveling, it looks like, out of um, the town to be able to find her for the potions, which I have to do anyways because we did find a potion, and technically because I don't have a magic user in my group, it's going to be hard for them to be able to detect what it is, so they want to get it basically appraised first to find out what it does. But enough talk there. Let's see how... The merchant reacts to them as they walk in. Here is the cool thing I love about this. So here are the NPCs and let's see what the memorial traits are. Let's see when they walk in, what's the first thing they notice about this merchant behind the counter. So we're gonna do a D100 roll. 73. So as we walk in, we notice a uh, kind of heavy set, plump, out of shape, older uh, gentleman sitting there. Looks like his business has been good to him, and you know, by the judge of his weight, it, you, we can kind of see that. Um, As we walk in, he is rather ambitious. He he sits up and is uh, uh, is not lacking customer service. Uh, ask what he can help us with, and would there be any provisions or anything that we are looking for? He could help us find. So, um, while this is happening in the NPC's mind right now he's worrying about a debt there's a debt that he has to collect maybe a payment that he was promised that wasn't due and so he sees us coming in and he's kind of relieved he's thinking well maybe I can recoup some of my costs that I've lost and uh, basically try um, schmoozing these guys into buying maybe more than what they need so at this point, he's going to try to be friendly, so I'm going to consider him a friendly NPC, and I'm going to see how his, what his intent is. A seven. So, he's hesitant to agree, and I'm going to interpret that as he's going to be hesitant to agree on the price. So he's probably going to want to mark everything up higher price than what it's really, really worth. And, um, so, as my fighter's looking around, um, and he's looking at, 
possibly to upgrade um, his backpack and the merchant at that point um, says well here why don't you try it on and uh, see what you think you know it's only 25 gold and it's a very nice backpack now my character can tell that it's really not that great of um, construction and pretty much it's probably he knows definitely not worth 25 maybe two so my fighter looks over at him and says uh, mm, no I wouldn't give you 25 for this so I'm gonna go to the Oracle and see how his reaction is gonna be to this and I wanna see is he gonna be upset about this or is he just going to try to save face and keep being nice to try to make a sale so let's see how this works out no and there's a complication but so as the fighter because as I rolled it on this oracle it came up no but there is a complication to it and it's the failure of a piece of gear either for the hero or the NPC so as the fighter's holding it and he's looking at the backpack and shaking it and he's like I wouldn't give you 25 gold for this piece of junk the stitching comes apart and um, it's now at this point that uh, there is an issue here and how does the merchant react to this um, does he demand full payment or how is he going to this is going to be interesting so will he demand full payment let's see what the Oracle says no <laughs> but there's a twist to it three an error on the assumption the NPC is making so how I'm going to interpret that is whatever debt this uh, merchant has to collect I think maybe he sees these three as a rabble sent to intimidate him so at this time he's just like oh no 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 I'll, you know i'll take care of that our backpacks aren't really don't do that you can just set that down there and uh maybe try another one or try some of our other provisions and and look at some of the other gear we have around the shop uh it's at this point i think the overall collective uh mindset of my characters here are yeah, this guy is kind of a schmoozer, and it's time to uh, get out of here and um, find somewhere else. So, um, as we start to head towards the door, um, let's see how the NPC is going to react with us leaving this area. Roll the wrong dice. Wrong table here. So as we head towards the door to leave, um, my fighter notices he has this um, look of relief come over him like, oh, finally they're leaving. And we exit the provisions and decide to head through town. As we're walking along, we come across the Shrine of Luck. I have not been here yet, so I want to see what the Shrine of Luck is about. I want to... Uh... And then I think after that, what I'm going to do is return to the tavern and see if things have changed and see if I can get some more information. I guess the Shrine of Luck must be a little further back here. Ah, <laughs> oh, there it is. 
So Fandalin's only temple is a shrine made of stones taken from the nearby ruins. It is dedicated to Tamora, the goddess of luck and good fortune, and is normally in the care of a zealous elf occult, occulte, named Sister Garele. However, she is out of town for the duration of this adventure. Sister Garele is a member of the Harpers, a scattered network of adventurers and spies who advocate equality and covertly oppose the abuse of power. The Harpers gather information throughout the land to thwart tyrants. They aid the weak, the poor, and the oppressed. Sister Garelli regularly reports to her superiors on events. Okay, so um, let's see. First of all, let's see if there's anybody in the area of the Shrine of Luck. So normally how I do this with my RPGs um, is I'm going to roll my 10-sider to give me my base number to roll my percentage against. So there's a 10% chance that there will be other people at the shrine when we venture over that way to go check it out. And a 26%. So no, there's nobody there. So as we enter into this stone area and look around there's obviously melted candle wax and um, offerings that are lined up around um, the outer perimeter of the uh, um, of the of the shrine Duh, I can't re I can't remember that name so um, I'm gonna see if my character, the cleric, because she does have um, the insight, and I'm going to roll and see if she figures out as to which goddess this shrine is made for. So to do that, I'm going to take my 20 cider and I got a plus seven to add to that roll. So let's see how this works out. Um, I'm gonna set my difficulty class at a 15. I wanna see if I can get a 15 or better. So I roll a two and she's kind of perplexed. She's never really seen, um, it's a crude mage, shrine and there's really no identifiable identifiable symbols or anything else other than burnt offerings melted candle wax and incense brazers to be able to um give her any indication as to what it's for so she's kind of um how do i put this kind of at a loss. She doesn't sense any evil from it, so she knows it's a good shrine. She just doesn't know which deity it is. So, uh, with that being that it is empty, and I wonder if there's anything of interest in here. So let me go back to my oracle and see. And then we're going to return to the tavern. So I'm going to, first of all, check out the feature details. And because this is um great past events this is a shrine built out of the remains of the city that was here before it and i'm gonna see if they can find any clues because they are dwarves and they do have stone cunning to see if they pick up on anything but and they roll a five so as they're surveying the area and looking at it, as they look closer at the shrine and they're looking around, they see um, 
very telltale signs that there was a great battle here at one time. Even though they don't know the history of this place and they're still learning it. But they can tell by looking at the stones. They can see um, the chip marks from uh, what looks like uh, sharpened weapons that have hit the stone. And there's spalded areas of the rock that have been burned indicating that there was uh, parts of what this shrine is made out of at one time was involved in a large fire, possibly a large structure fire and stuff like that. So they're piecing it together that there's more to this town than what it's it first appears and there's a reason possibly behind it as to why it was attacked in the first place because they are from the far north so they're in um, uncharted territory. They're not from around here. They're learning. They're here because of um, some tips that they've been given saying that possibly the king's grandson may have moved through this town or frequented it. So anyway, let's move on from there and head back to the Stone Hill Inn. So as we walk into the Stone Hill Inn. First of all, I'm going to do my percentage again, give me myself a base percentage and see if things have improved there or if they're still the same. So, I roll a 10. And I have a 70. Well, that right there tells me didn't roll below it so the rebel rousers have evidently left and as I walk into as my characters walk into the tavern let's go back to the NPC reactions um, the local patrons are there now the locals of the town things are starting to change it's getting closer towards the afternoon so more of them are coming in to quench their thirst and grab a bite to eat uh, so I'm gonna put friendly NPCs so as we walk in this time let's see how we are received well, persuadable as we walk in they, they look they're not like I am suspiciously they they know we're here on official business we're not here to cause trouble and they're kind of just look over and like hey, hey, you know um, not really welcome open friendly inviting us to their um, home for dinner but they're not uh, giving us the evil eye either so we walk over to the bar and we are talking to the tavern keep and we have a conversation and explain to him about what we encountered out at the lighthouse and uh, he said that he has heard recent um, rumor around the town that let's roll the d6 That once again, the orcs have come down from the mountains to prey on the lowlands in Neverwinter. Doesn't send help soon. The orcs will over... So, to put it in a nutshell, um, he's heard rumors that orcs are planning on possibly raiding the village and this is where they learn the history from what they kind of started to figure out in the shrine by looking at um, the shrine how it was built out of the remains of some of the ruined stone structures as you can see here as they have those marked out around the map and that there was a great war it involved um, orcs and that Rumors are spreading that they are moving down from the mountains again and planning to raid the village and possibly um, 
at this point the barkeep says maybe perhaps that uh, party you were telling me about with that individual you're looking for um, maybe they were heading up towards that way because he says I'm sure if word has reached here I'm sure uh, word has reached to other villages and the area as well so um, let's see how this is going to so my fighter being um, how do we put this very well outspoken just kind of at that point says well if we save your your village what do we get out of it that really has nothing to do with us finding the person we have to find this is just extra added work on our behalf let's see how the NPC reacts to that question um, sneering contempt so he kind of um, in a way begrudgingly slams the uh, dwarf's ale onto the uh, bar and says here you go and slides it over to him and he's like well you know that's uh, I guess a, a route that we could take and he says uh, you know that's kind of um, that's kind of a really crappy way to treat people in need of help particularly you know a town that's really not too fond of your kind to begin with and some of the people that have at this point uh, welcomed you into their daily lives and offer you um, food and sometimes shelter when needed um, I want to see the reaction of my rogue. He's the guy that specializes in espionage and stuff like that. So I want to roll on his, at this point, his intelligence. I want to see from what he took from this conversation if he thinks there's really any merit to risking going up to this area to investigate it so I'm going to set uh, the DC at 15 seems like a decent number and I got a plus two to my uh, ability there so let's see how I roll up. I got a 10 and a 12 so don't really make it the uh, I'm just at that point my rogue grabs his ale and spins around in the seat drinking it and he's like you know for once I agree with the blockhead fighter down there maybe this is a fight we should stay out of the cleric let's see how the cleric is reacting to this if the cleric is going to follow suit or if the cleric um, is trying to convince them otherwise so once again I'm going to use um, my intelligence. The reason why I'm using my intelligence not the wisdom is this is going to be more of come from the mindset of is this going to help us or how much risk do we have involved in here. So let's see DC 15 intelligence got a plus two to her ability score. Well, <laughs> that's a nine. Um, it's at that point, the cleric slams her hands down on the table and says, I agree. He says, it's not our fight. Even though, uh, he said, we you know, appreciate uh, your hospitality that you have shown us. They said, we are not here to fight other people's battles. We are here to find... Uh, somebody of great importance and we cannot let anything else interfere with our mission in doing that so the cleric at that point 
knowing that this situation could possibly go um, south fairly quickly. It's going to throw three gold onto the bar towards the tavern keep and say, it says here, as a token of our appreciation for what you have done for us so far, and he says, you have to understand, we can't get involved in a war that this, we have no reason uh, to really be involved in or provoke. But if you could give us any information as to any inkling of an idea, if you've heard anything about the person in question, we would be greatly in your debt and any treasure that we would come across in the process of doing so, we would gladly give you a percentage of. Let's see how the NPC reacts to that. A four. Reasoned refusal. So the tavern keep eyes the gold for a second and slowly pushes it back across the bar to the cleric and says, you have to understand, um, he says, we're in need of help, and even though your offer sounds really good, um, I really don't have any other leads to give you at this time. He says, I can only ask that people of your talents and uh, may be able to offer your services and help defend us in time of need. But, he says, at this point, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to refuse your offer. He said, and, uh, maybe you can check around town. Maybe somebody else may be able to give you some information. So, that's not going to go very well right now. Uh, yeah. So, evidently, with the crowd that was in there before, must have had some connection to this particular quest in the book and why he didn't want to talk about it before them and so there is the threat of orcs possibly raiding this village so after they finish their ales I think what I'm going to do is head back over to the lion shield coster and I'm going to see if I can get any information out of that merchant, considering we did spend a decent amount of gold in there, and uh, she seems to be pretty smitten with us. So after we finish our ales, we move over to the Lion Shield Coster. Let's see how we are perceived when we walk in the door. I'm going to roll on the friendly NPC chart, and I roll a six. So, as we walk in, uh, she's all smiles and happy to see us, and is like, oh, welcome back. What can I help you with this time? Is there, you know, maybe you, you need a new axe, or perhaps maybe a new helm. Um, it's at that point, who do I want to represent our group? I don't think the fighter is going to be the best because he's just kind of uh, very crude, straight to the point. Matter of fact, I'm going to use the rogue and I'm going to see how the rogue can use the situation to his advantage and possibly get some information here. So, I'm going to, Rogue is going to go about it by not giving up too much information that they are looking for the king's grandson, but they are looking for a person of great interest that 
they have been contracted to locate the whereabouts and bring back by no means is it a criminal or anything like that but um, there could potentially be some decent reward into it if they get the right information to send them into the right direction to find this person so he explains the individual to him and let's see what the memorable traits of the grandson is that's always going to be fun to see I'm trying to find this uh, sneering little brat 15 so he says you would recognize him he uh he's blind in one eye one eye is completely uh white and but he is fiercely loyal if he agrees to doing something he will stick through to it to the end see it through the end i'm gonna roll um, DC 15 with my charisma, my plus two, and I want to see how this is perceived. Actually, you know what? I'm going to roll with advantage this time. So I'm going to do that. And the reason why I'm going to do that is the NPC is already pretty happy to see us back there. We spent some decent money and maybe the fact that we're sweetening the deal a little bit with the offer of a reward will help persuade so let's see this I'm gonna give advantage to his save roll here and let's see against his charisma how it works out so I rolled a 19 and a 10 I'm gonna take a 19 so let's see how the NPC uh, react she's kind of smitten with the way he's presented it she's you know really drawn in and listening intently to every word he has to say so let's see friendly NPC we're gonna roll 2d6 and see how her reaction is so she hesitantly you know, she's like, well, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, she's like, uh, I don't know if I ever remember seeing a person come through here like that. But, she's, but I have um, heard some rumors of customers passing through that they saw an odd band of people uh, a couple of weeks pass through here. And they were headed in. Let's roll and see if she will give up a decent quest here. Roll a two. So she explains to him that she overheard a conversation that a small band of uh, outsiders to this area were seen heading to the ruins of Conbury. And that's a town not so far from here that was um, sacked by barbarians years ago. And in there, there's a ruined temple south of the Conbury, where it is said that the locals hide their gold. Possibly, perhaps, she says, maybe he was heading there. Maybe he heard the uh, rumors about the gold and decided to go that way. So it's at that point, um, my rogue is going to, what I'm going to do is try to kind of cement this and Maybe by... I'm going to give her a gold piece. And... So the rogue reaches into his coin pouch, pulls out a gold piece, and slides it across the counter to her and says, Thank you, ma'am. Says, you've been most helpful. And I hope, looking forward to doing more business with you in the future. Maybe when it uh, comes time to uh, get some new armor, I will come back here and spend my coinage wisely here with you. Let's see how she reacts to that. So I'm gonna roll my 2d6. She's 
she at that point uh, laughs at him uh, like oh no 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 she's like you you know possibly she's like I, I, I couldn't take your money for that no 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 and he's like no 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 you keep that you you keep that for yourself he said and uh, he said just remember if anybody comes through here asking if they've seen anybody like us passing through hmm Maybe the coin can serve as a reminder that we never had this conversation. She grins and at that point puts the coin in her coin purse. And uh, at that point, there's a mutual agreement between my rogue and her. Now it's at this point, we are going to head to the Tribor Trail. So let me look up the details of the Tribor Trail and see where the Tribor Trail goes to. Uh, let's look at the front of the book. That make more sense. So here we are, the Shrine of Savras. The Shrine of Savras is balanced for characters of 1st to 6th level. This location is not connected to any quest through one of the entries in the Vandalin Tales table, page 9, blah 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 blah, might lure adventures here. Okay, so location overview. Five miles south of Conbury is a shrine dedicated to the god of innovation and fate. Mm -hmm -hmm. Um, Conbury given the townsfolk time to escape. Not all townsfolk choose to flee, but those who did went to the shrine and brought much of their town's gold with them. The barbarians eventually tracked down the townsfolk to the shrine, besieged it, and slaughtered everybody inside. Yeah, sounds like good times. In the days leading up to this final battle, the priest seers helped the townsfolk hide their gold in plain sight. They melted down the coins and recast them into a bell, which they painted and hung in the shrine's belfry, replacing the old iron bell. The gold bell hangs there to this day. Over the years, many other creatures have occupied the shrine, most recently a gang of werecats layered here until they were driven out by orcs displayed by Crivane the White Dragon. Recently ogres wandered by the shrine, saw the orcs, and decided to join them. Okay. So here is going to be our map and our layout. So how I would normally do that at this point is lay out the tiles to this map. The hard thing that's going to be is creating the outer perimeter of this map as well because um, that you know would require having a space probably larger than this table to do. So how I deal with that is um, I will break up the section. So obviously here is the entrance way that goes into this part right here which is 50 which is S1 and um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a tile that's going to closely fit that area and looking at the map it's one two three four five six squares by one two three four six by four so let me see if we can find something that will fit that And it doesn't have to be, um, so to speak, like stone tile. It can be rough area like this. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh -huh. That'll actually work. If I... 
I think this one will work out much better. So I'm going to set that here and I'm going to put my characters at the entrance of S1. Um, I think to be on the safe side what I'm going to do is use the rogue and use his stealth ability to see if there's anything in there, any dangers I should be worried about at this point. So when I run my areas like this, um, like I said, the fog of war thing, it's going to be really hard because you're going to see the map. You're going to have to understand everything. You're going to have to read the local overview and all of that stuff, which, like I said, yeah, it's going to spoil a little bit for you. But feel free to change things up. Add some chaos into it to make it more fun for yourself. So let's read the arrival and... The ruin stands in the middle of a vast field north of the rocky foothills of the Sword Mountains. An old stone temple with a belfry jutting from its peak roof is enclosed by stone walls, many sections of which have collapsed. The trail ends at a crumbling gatehouse, the doors to which were sundered long ago. Three of the four towers that once stood at the corners of the outer walls have collapsed. Only the northeast tower remains, and a guard stands atop of it. Oh, this ain't good. So, this is where I will skip over the area just reading what's pertinent to this module and changing what. I like um, this has to fit more or less my gaming um, taste I guess you should say and just to change things up a bit so the guard at the top blah 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 so during the day the characters can't approach a shrine without being seen in this century as there are no places to hide in the level field surrounding the shrine. If the characters wait until nightfall, clouds obscure the moon and enable them to approach on scene as long as they stay outside the, the 60 foot range of the orc's dark vision. If the orcs spot the characters, it cries out, rousing the shrine, other occupants, blah 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 blah. Okay, we get the gist of that. So basically if you're spotted 60 feet from this area where there is an orc standing as lookout right here in this tower will have an issue. So let me see, what can I possibly... So this is what I'm going to do. First thing is, we have the location. We've got the information out of the merchant at the Lion Shield Coster, and now we're heading here to see if we can't pick up on the trail and possibly find um, the Lost Grandson. So, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to see how much time has passed between all of this. So, I'm going to roll a d4 and I'm going to add up those hours that we spent in the town. So the first place we went to was the tavern and then we went from the tavern over to um, the general trade store. So we had an hour wrapped up there in the general trade store. How much time did we have wrapped up in there? Four. So we're up to five hours and including the shrine and back to I'm gonna say five hours yeah five hours if we were to wrap up between the tavern to the um, general provision store to check out the shrine and then to come back to the tavern and then go to uh, the lion's coster so five hours and when my characters had reached back into the town it was um mid-morning so that would put us towards late afternoon and let's see how much time we have in traveling to get to this area two hours so it's not nightfall yet but it's 
um, getting close to late afternoon and as they follow the um, directions from where they received from the lady at the Lion Shield Coster now I want to add a little bit more into that I want to know what is the weather like um, what can I expect that can actually help maybe improve the chances for my characters here so um well we are in the area of never winter so I'm going to say let me get a base for the season, whether it's the dry season or the wet season. And I rolled a six, so there's a 60% chance that we are into the dry season. Let's see what we rolled. 62. Okay, so it's not the dry season. I rolled above 60. We are into the wet season of the year. So let me see what the weather is going to be like. Nine. Haha, <laughs> how interesting. Mudslide, lose important non magical item. Okay. So, as we are heading to this location, um, we are walking through some heavy, drenching rain. And as uh, indicated there by the random table, a mudslide has occurred and my characters have been delayed as a result of that. Let's roll the d4 to see what we have. By an hour. That delayed them by an hour and they have lost one non-magical item. So let me see the item that I'm going to have to lose. This is Don't want to lose any armor or any weapons. That would really, really, really stink. So since my rogue generally takes point, I'm going to say, um, as a result of the mudslide and being caught up in this, the rope that he had tied to his pack at that point had come undone and was just washed downstream and into this mud heap so he has lost his hemp rope and as we reach the area we have a heavy rain it's dark gray um, it's not exactly nightfall yet but it is uh, getting closer to very late afternoon almost dusk so now what I want to do is I want to see how... I'm going to send my rogue. He is going to use his stealth. And he's got a plus 7 to his stealth. So, um, And he also has dark vision. So we're going to be pretty even, evenly matched with the orc as far as that goes. But um, Yeah. So... As let me just explain to you what I have going on here so to give you a better idea. So my at that point my uh, rogue is going to try to stealthily sneak up into this area and survey it without being seen because we have an orc here that is on the lookout. So now, considering that that orc is sitting on, not sitting, but actually standing on um, a parapet, if you will, with the ability to be able to look way far out, and he's got that line of sight advantage on my character, the difficulty level is going to go way up. It's going to be a DC 20. So, this is going to be... Um, 
kind of hard and given that it is uh, still daylight um, and not nighttime he's gonna have to do this at a disadvantage so we're gonna see how this works out here so I'm gonna roll my 2d20 and he's gonna have a disadvantage to this oh boy we can only hope Okay, so I rolled a 19 and a 13. I'm taking the 13 and adding 7 to it. So, believe it or not, I made it. So, my rogue is able to get close enough to the outer perimeter here, like he would normally do, even if there wasn't a without even knowing that this guy is here he would just normally do that to survey the area to see if there's anything we should be worried about now as he's looking around and surveying I want to see how well he's gonna be hidden um, and I'm gonna use a my dex. I'm gonna do a dex. He's gonna have to roll for um, disadvantage on that as well, just because of the giving conditions and the orc and everything else. But given the fact that he's in tall grass, he is a dwarf and all of that, he's covered in mud, he's kind of blending into the surroundings, if you will. Um, I'm gonna say a DC 15 for this, for him to actually be concealed. So let's see how that works out. I rolled an 18 and a 13. I'm going to take the 13, and I got a dex bonus of 3, which he more than certainly makes it. So he's able to get up into this area here of tall grass and is able to crouch down. He's, uh, he's in there. He's hidden. So far, he has bypassed all the um, orc security measures, and he is now going to roll... Um, I'm going to use my intelligence. I mean, he's going to look and survey the area and see using his wits, or should I use my wisdom? I think I'll use my wisdom to see if he uh, notices any abnormal movement and or anything that they should be concerned about. And doing so... Um, That's really not going to... Actually, you know what? He's going to have advantage. It's daylight, and it's not nighttime. So any movement from this area, he should be able to see the orc moving around. Ha ha ha. So let's see how this works. The tables have turned. And I'm going to make that a DC... Considering he's hidden, he's stationary, he's looking... Um, he's just sitting there looking and surveying. I'm going to say a DC 10. It's not going to be really all that hard. He rolled a 3 and an 8. So I will be taking the 8, adding my wisdom into it, which is a 9. So unfortunately, as he's checking everything out and looking, he doesn't notice the orc up in that area. And motions to everybody else at that point to move forward and come ahead so as they start at that point let's turn the camera so we can see what's going on here so here is the entrance to the area and let me uh, see if we can dial this in a little bit better so we're gonna have crumbling walls here lead into it and here Say so, it's going to give us an area to be able to enter through right there. And the next thing I'm going to want to do is I want to see 
how far are my characters away from the entrance when they are noticed? Now, typically how I like to do this is I want to use a couple of six-siders. I'm going to roll those, add it up together, and figure out how many feet before they are detected. So five. Not five feet, but you're going to see what I'm talking about here. So five spaces, if you will, looking at the map. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. According to the map, that's perfect. So as they begin to, at that point, come into range, it's at that point that the orc alerts everybody else. And let's see how this uh Hmm. Well, this is about to get really ugly. And So beyond this area right here, I'm going to say where my characters are at, looking at the map. Um, so it's going to go into an area like so, and then that's going to open up into an even larger area. which will be here, which will be the courtyard area. And you're going to figure out why this is the way it is. And of course, that area is going to have, as indicated by a map, a set of doors here. All right, so that's pretty well scaled to the way the map is right there, and Okay, this is where things start to get ugly, and that's really good. Um, let me see, how do I want to... I think I'm going to change things up a little bit and I'm just going to keep it right where it's at at this point. Um, let me get to my encounter section.
Okay. <clears throat> so here is how this plays out. So as my characters get close and they can see through this area and they're getting ready to um, enter into it, it is at that point um, my rogue sees something that he does not really want to see. And these double doors right here are flung wide open and to his uh, horror, I guess we should say, he sees a very angry mob of orcs that are, as far as he can tell, piling out of this place heading towards them. And they do not look that happy to see him. So, at this point, um, I'm going to have to roll some initiative here, and I'm going to have to figure out what we are actually going to do. Because we are outnumbered 3 to 1. Um, this is going to get kind of hairy. All right. So let me get the initiative out of the way. Of course, I'm going to roll a 20 cider and I'm going to add my dex bonus to that. So I'm going to do the best. That's going to be. So my cleric will have a 12. Oh, not a 1. Never a 1. Um, my. Points. My fighter will be running at a 12. Alright, that's pretty cool. And then my rogue. Wow, an 18, he is moving fast. Will be 20, and then the encounter. Let's see where the orcs are moving. They have a plus one to their dexterity, a 14. Whoa! Okay, so, all right, um, they use a great axe or a javelin, great, oh boy, cannot wait, all right, um, so it is at this point, uh, the first one in the batting order is my rogue. As he gets to this point, um, he sees this rabble come pouring out. Um, unfortunately, um, he, well, did not have a weapon ready. So I'm wondering what's going to be his best choice here so I think the best thing to do is his first round is going to be um, probably backing out of that door and drawing his bow because he's kind of got him in a choke point right here which is you know Now, here's the cool thing I do like about 5th edition, and one of the things that they put in there is Frightened. So, uh, my rogue can see what's happening, and as he motions for them to stop, I'm going to roll for each one of them and see if any of them are frightened by the sight of this huge mob that's getting ready to descend upon them. <laughs> And if they fail, they have to roll at a disadvantage. So let's see how that works. I'm going to set um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wow. So considering there are nine of them, I'm going to set this DC at a 19. Um, I think that's only fair. 
so as my rogue at that point sees this let's see if he can save himself let's see if uh, let's see if he can stomach this sight I'm gonna roll against my constitution to see if he can save against that and that's he's got a plus two bonus to that so let's see no he is frightened what about the fighter The fighter, he... I'm going to roll against his charisma. He's not going to back down. He's only going to get a plus one, but... Hope he rolls high. A 20. Yeah, he's... He's ready for the fight. He's foaming at the mouth. And my cleric... Has a... I'm going to... Go with... I'm going to go with her wisdom on this save. Um, she's a cleric. She's wise in the ways of religion and stuff like that. And maybe she's wise enough to look and say, hey, maybe it's time to get the heck out of here. So let's see how she does. 19. Okay, so um, she is not frightened by the sight. And is willing to stand her ground. The fire is foaming at the mouth, ready to jump right into action, and my rogue has scurried out the door and in trembling hands getting his bow ready. That was his first action. Unfortunately, it is now the orc's turn in initiative, and let's see what their movement is. Their speed is 30. So, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty, five, thirty. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty, five, thirty. These guys are all pretty much screwing up in a huge So that was, and the only one that I have there that is arranged is this guy right here. He's all the way in the back. He's not going to have line of sight of them, so they're going to be safe this round from that. But unfortunately, I got one guy here that has a spear and one guy here that has a bow. So that can get pretty ugly. The rest of them have um, melee weapons, so that was their round. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, the fighter first. He's like foaming at the mouth. He is ready for battle. And uh, so I'm going to. He has a skill in athletics and a plus seven. I'm gonna roll to see if he can leap through the doorway, and in doing so try to hit this guy, just pile drive him with his uh, great axe, split his skull in two. Let's see how this works out. And then if he succeeds at that, I'm going to say he gets advantage to his attack as well. Okay, so um, at DC level, I'm going to set it at a 15 for him to leap through the doorway at that guy. Let's see if he successfully lands it. If not, he's just going to have a regular old attack. His jump isn't going to be as, um, how do we put this, courageous as he thinks that it's going to be. So his dexterity is a two. He's got a plus two. No, um, in his mind he thinks he made a huge leap, but really he just jumped over the little rubble pile and scurried up. So he's just going to make a normal attack and he gets a plus four to that attack. Let's see how he does. A 15 plus 4 is a 19. The Orc's AC is a 13, so he more than has enough to hit. They have uh, a 
they have a total of 15 hit points each. So I'm going to mark that down on my sheet, start keeping track, and moving on from there. So using his great weapon fighting, and he also has action surge that he can use again. So I may burn that up and um, depending on, I, yeah, as a matter of fact, I know I am with this many enemies, I'm going to burn that up just to try to get me ahead of everything here. But with great weapon fighting at this point, um, he can use both hands on his weapon and it gives him a, at that point, more damage that he can deliver. The cool thing is with the two weapon fighting, the great weapon fighting, is if he rolls a one on his ten sider, he can re-roll that. But if he rolls a one again, he has to keep that. But if he rolls higher, he gets to use that instead. So let's let's take care of business here. I'm gonna do the damage to him and then I'm gonna use my action surge action surge and immediately take another turd. So he's going to roll his 1d10. He rolls a 7. He does 10 points of damage to number 1 here, which knocks it down to 5. With his action surge, he's going to take another attack. And with that, I mean, he just pretty much devastated me. That, that's a lot of damage. I'm going to give him an advantage on his next attack just for the fact that that orc was just caught off guard. I mean, he was just blown right back. So I got a 1 and a 6. I'm going to take the 6 and I'm going to add 7 to that. So we got 10, 12, 13. Um, luckily, it hits the target and... With that, I'm going to roll his damage again. A four. I'm going to add the three into that. That's seven points. And he's done. He's off the map. He is done. So he comes in and just slash, slash, two slashes, and the orc is done. All right. Now it is my cleric's turn, and I'm going to have to make some decisions here as to what I want to do with the cleric, because I really don't want to get the cleric too involved into combat. Hmm. I think I'm going to cast secret flame upon this one and what that does is a radiant light comes down a flame and it will just basically incinerate whoever is right there but considering they are orcs they don't like light and um the fact that it's magic may give me some advantage against this uh encounter right here so yeah casting time I'm going to cast that unfortunately this orc does get a saving throw against that so has a wisdom has no um at that point wisdom modifier to worry about but I'm going to say that the orc has a a save of 16 or better. Let's see where the orc goes. Orc rolls a 2. Um, just like I said, radiant light appears above the orc, lighting it up, and it bursts into flames, dealing 1d8 damage. Oh, 8 points. That is awesome. So, this thing is on fire and screaming at this point. Um, which gets back to the whole entire fear save thing.
So I'm going to roll collectively for the group rather than rolling for each individual orc. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'm going to break it up instead. I think that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to roll for these three and then I'm going to roll one for these four. So these three right here were in perfect line of sight and were able to witness this. And I want to see how their reaction is going to be to that. So they're relatively stupid creatures. I mean, they got an intelligence of seven. Um, for them, I'm going to set the save at a 16. I want to see if they can actually pull themselves or if they're just completely frozen in stupid fear. They roll a 13. They don't succeed. They they have witnessed a magical event that um, they don't understand and they are stricken in fear. These four back here, let's see how they react to that. They roll an 18. They're kind of oblivious as to what's going on and um, they're willing to give up their lives to defend their position inside of uh, this cozy little ruins here. So at that point, um, they're going to, these guys will have disadvantage to their attack rolls. These guys are going to attack normally, but they are going to push forward past them and spill out into this area right here. So they got a movement of 30. Five, he's going to attack him. 15, 20, 20, 20. Move him up there, and I'm going to move him around here. Okay, the bad thing is, is the archer is now out on the board, and he has a clear line of sight to my rogue, who is basically um, shaking in fear right now as to everything going on and I think the first attack is going to be from him so he's going to roll and he gets a plus plus five jeez oh peace it's a 19, so he definitely uh, does some damage there. Oh, and my rogue is going to take three points of damage. I'm going to mark that down here. So he's at a 12. Nothing like uh, just driving that fear straight home all right um this guy is a blaze he's on fire um these guys right here um i'm gonna roll my six out. i want to see something here they're all gonna take a five foot step back away from him because they're just they're shaking in fear they don't understand what's going on this guy's screaming he's burning up um this guy right here is going to take an attack on my fighter so let's see how that's gonna work out he's got a great axe he's gets a plus five to his hit as well oh yeah he hits um 1d12 plus three. Oh man this is gonna hurt He does seven points of damage to my fighter. Um, wow. I'm just gonna knock him down to 11. All right, top of the batting order is going to be um, 
my rogue. He's rolling with disadvantage, and he's going to retaliate. He's going to shoot back. If he's successful, I want to roll again and see if he shakes his fear or not. So let's see how this goes. Oh. So... I gotta take the last of the two rolls. He rolls a one. He is so frightened that he goes to lift his bow and knock the arrow, and as he goes to pull the arrow back, he actually drops it out of the bow onto the ground. And just, oh man, he is unnerved. And now, goes over to my fighter. My fighter, he's not too happy. He just takes, took some serious, uh, <laughs> serious damage there. And he is going to, uh, at that point, give him a good what for. Right. My fighter should be getting a plus yeah, plus four to his roll. All right, so he hits, and he's going to use his d10. Oh, roll a one, get to re-roll that. Two weapon fighting, six, add the three. Does 10 points of damage. He does knock that dude right out of the park. Uh, he's still on his feet, but trust me, he knows he's been hit. And, uh, now it's going to go back over to my cleric. Uh, let me see what my cleric can do here. And my cleric is going to cast shield of faith upon my fighter right here what that's going to do is it's going to give him a plus two ac to uh which is you know he's really going to need so he gets plus two to his ac i'm going to roll the 1d8 again this guy is on fire burning up let's see how much more damage he actually takes seven more points oh wow well. um yeah, that dude's just, uh, he's incinerated. He just falls to the floor smoldering in uh, flames. He's done. All right. Now it goes back to <laughs> my rogue again. And my rogue is going to try... Once again, rolling disadvantage to see if he can hit his target. Let's see how this works out. He rolled a five. At least it's not a one. Uh, he rolled a five. Basically lost an arrow. Um, but the good thing, I did not land a hit. So... He is still fearful, still rolling disadvantage. So I basically lost an arrow as it ricochets off the walls in the room. Just making a laughing spectacle for the enemies. That's all. Nothing big. All right. Uh, this guy is going to move up and he's going to be getting two attacks on him. He's going to advance towards the door. 30 and he's within range to attack him um, these guys I'm going to roll see if they have a have rolled a save of a 16 or better if not they're just going to keep advancing back further into the compound because they're not too sure about the cleric they, you know they just seen their buddy incinerated in thin air Nope, a six. So they're just slowly backing away from the fight. They're just like, you guys can have it. We are uh, getting out of here. So he's going to attack my rogue. 
and he gets a plus five with that thing. It's a 12. No, my rogue's got pretty good armor, so he would need a, actually a 15 or better, so he's safe from that attack. Um, unfortunately, this guy's taking two attacks, but he gets a plus two to his AC because of that spell on him. So let's see how this works out. A 4 and a 17. Well, what is my AC currently at? My AC is currently at 16, plus 2 would be 18. Um, but unfortunately, the weapons have a plus 5, so I do take a hit. And I'm going to take 1d12 plus 3. Ouch, that's 7 more points of damage. Four points. He is getting very badly wounded. Um, now that the and of course this orc's gonna get his chance to fire another arrow at my rogue. Rolling a one. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, he doesn't do it. He's experiencing uh, problems as well. So that's pretty cool. That is very cool. And now it goes over it was Orky's turn. It goes back to my fighter. He is not happy. He is not happy at all. He is bleeding. He is upset. And he wants to kill something. And I'm going to finish what I started with this one right here. Oh yeah, alright. I don't even need to add my bonus in. And... Uh, that's more than enough than what he needs. He just cleaves this guy right down. He is out of the picture. Alright. I have my cleric, and unfortunately, my cleric's kind of in the line of fire right now. Um, I don't think casting a spell is going to be the most uh, best course of action at this point. I think at this point, um, yeah, I think using the mace is going to be the best thing. And that's what the cleric's gonna do. The cleric's just going to try to whack this guy upside the head with uh, the mace, and let's see how that works out. 12 plus my proficiency hits, and plus six points of damage. Yeah, that'll wake you up. Alright, now it goes back to the top of the batting order, but goes back to my rogue. Hopefully my rogue at this point can snap out of this. He's going to, at this point, drop the bow, and he's got two daggers. I'm going to just focus both daggers, throwing them straight at that thing right there. So he's just... Well, actually, it's going to be one. He's going to see if he could whip a dagger right at that thing, maybe between its eyes. Cool. 14. Got it. Um, D4 plus 3. I do six more points of damage to that thing. That thing is wounded. It is not happy. It's bleeding. But the good thing is, I get to re-roll. DC 15. Um, oh, I forgot to roll two dice because I had disadvantage. Let me see here. Let me see if he gets his uh, save. I got a 12. I'm going to use his... Charisma, 13, 14. 
No, he does not. He's still frightened. Um, shoot. Either way, okay. So he's still rolling at a disadvantage, even though he threw the um, dagger, it landed, it did damage. Um, he's still just really shaken up and really scared at this point. Now it's going to go over to... Um, I'm going to go back to my fighter. Both my cleric and my fighter are running at the same speed, so I'm going to try to decimate that guy. Uh, it's not going to happen. He misses big time. Now my cleric's turn, and let me see what the cleric is going to do to that orc. Hopefully we can finish him off. And... My cleric has a plus four. Oh my god. Oh my god. So roll the one. Um, so my cleric missed. Moves off balance, spinning this way, which at that point gives this guy an opportunity to attack my cleric with advantage. This is gonna hurt. This is gonna hurt so bad. And he's gonna take the 16, which is gonna be more than enough to hit my cleric, and he's gonna do 1d12. Two, five points of damage to my cleric. Holy cow. Wow. All right. Uh, things ain't going too well here. Um, <laughs> it's back to the orc's turn again. And uh, let's hope things get better. So, I'm gonna see where he's at, he still has line of sight of him. And he's gonna fire a bow, an arrow at my rogue. God damn it. And he hits, he succeeds. He does three more points of damage to my rogue. My rogue. Is now he's still hanging in there, but it's not looking too well for him at this point. Um, this guy is going to hit my cleric again, and he has advantage. He's going to take the 11, and he gets a plus 5, which is a 16. And my cleric has a AC of 16, so yeah, he does that damage. Ouch, doing seven, eight. Wow, ten points of damage. That hurts. Um, my cleric is severely wounded. It's clinging on to life by one point at this and is spiraling to drain, barely able to keep consciousness, let alone lift the weapon. Um, this guy is going to attack my fighter. And he does not succeed. So I'm going to roll the save for these guys again. I'm going to see if they are still frightened or perhaps the change of events in here have, um, at that point, changed their mind as to what's going on here. So they got a save at a 16. They roll a 15 and, well, they don't really have any bonuses to their intelligence or anything like that so they move back another five feet they're just not convinced that they're that safe yet all right that was the uh orcs turn now it goes back to my rogue um 
my rogue at this point <laughs> um, I'm just going to use my short sword and try to do the best I can with disadvantage so he is he takes the four roll a 12 and a four and eight's not going to do it and he just does not hit his target it's not pretty um it's gonna go over to my fighter uh man the fighter's blocked in i think what the fighter is going to do is i'm going to use the disengage option here so in the fifth edition rule set you can use disengage your movement doesn't provoke opportunity to attack for the rest of the turn so even though I am engaged with him I'm gonna move back five feet and focus my attack here to get out the door and hopefully we can get the hell away from this so because we are just completely overrun so he gets a plus four to his turn 14 he hits a seven plus his turn if he has a three or a four three does 10 points of damage to that particular orc and at that point he just cleaves that thing almost in two um with the doorway open and the orc down he is able to step outside and it's at this point um they're both going to grab my cleric and just try to get the hell away from this whole entire situation because they're almost uh beat up real bad and Unfortunately, we cannot lose the cleric. So, the bad thing is, um, the orcs get their turn first. So, he's going to move up, swinging at um, my fighter. Hopefully, he does not succeed. He rolls a six. He does not. That's good. His... Well, he still has a line of sight, but because he is here, I'm going to give him a plus four to his AC just because this guy right here. So let's see how this works out. So my rogue will actually have an AC for this round only of a 19. 15 plus four. Uh, yeah, he's got it. 19. He hits. He does another six points of damage to my rogue. Three points. Yeesh. Okay. Um, it's now the rogue's turn, and I'm just going to take these two guys' turn. They both grab an arm, and they are going to, at that point, retreat and run away. Um... At this point, I think I'm going to end the game session right here. These guys are going to head back to town, obviously. They're going to have to get healed. They're going to, you know, lots of things that they're going to have to do. Um, this area proved to be a little harder than even I thought. And my characters just kind of got beat up pretty bad. So I think that's where we're going to leave this video off. Um, and that's how I do solo. This is how I do my solo RPG. You guys were able to see using the emulator here. Um, I was able to run the NPCs in town and actually make decent use of that and how well it worked and down to my combat as well. And that's going to be my game session. These guys are heading back they're pretty well beat up and that's that
all right guys hope you enjoyed and um looking forward to hearing from you all right this is artichoke dip signing off